Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and with video here on YouTube. Uh, as longtime viewers of my podcast or channel will know, uh, the subject of narcissism is pretty pervasive throughout the whole concept of what a destructive cult is, and uh, or a high control group, or author or authoritarian group. Narcissism has a lot to do with this, and we've talked um, at length with Rachel Bernstein and other uh, therapists and counselors about the subject of, of what is narcissism, how does it work. You know, anybody who's read books like The Sociopath Next Door or uh, gets into this field starts looking at the idea of individuals out there who don't really have. Uh, the same level of empathy or compassion or, or emotional involvement or investment with, with their fellow human beings that the rest of us feel that we do. And, um, and this has always been something that's been very, very fascinating to me. So whenever I find people who have expertise in this area, I want to talk to them. I want to share that information with you guys because I think it can, it's the sort of thing that can help all of us, uh, because you never know in your day-to-day -day life when you're going to run across one of these people and, and what kind of an effect they're going to be able to have on your existence. I mean, whether it's a boss or a potential romantic partner or a friend or a, a casual acquaintance, I mean, how much they have to do with your life and, and recognizing some of the signs and indications of whether somebody might not have your best interests at heart even though, of course, they say they do, uh, could be useful for any of us, as well as, of course, learning more about abusive relationships and destructive cults and how they work and how we can protect ourselves from them. So this week, I have Dan Shaw uh, on board. He is the author of a book called Traumatic Narcissism and uh, somebody that I met at the International Cultic Studies Association conference back here in, uh, just a couple months ago. And um, someone who's who actually knows and is uh, related with Rachel Bernstein and with others that we've talked to on this channel. So, Dan, welcome to my show. Thank you, Chris. Nice to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Um, so, uh, so first off, let's talk about you a little bit because uh, not everybody who's watched the show is going to know who you are. Your background. So, first off, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, I was a theater major at Northwestern, and I graduated in 1973. And by 1980, I just couldn't hold myself together. That the uh, the successes I had were very much outweighed by the failures in my professional aspirations. Everything was kind of going downhill for me at this particular juncture, and I had the very uh, sad misfortune in, in some ways of being introduced by a few of their friends to a meditation uh, community led by an Indian guru. That was Siddha Yoga, at that time led by Swami Muktananda, or he was known as Baba. Um, once I got the bug there, meditation was, was pretty powerful. The experiences were actually very beautiful. Um, mystical, I would say powerful. I was lifted out of depression. And unfortunately, I didn't leave it there. I wanted to take it further. Um, I got deeply involved in that group for the next 13 years, living and working full time in the ashram community. Muktananda died and he had a couple of successors, brother and sister. They were at war with each other. And I ended up with the sister. She's known as Guru Mai. I was um, rising up in the organization for the next, uh, like I say, about 10 years. Uh, and so I became a manager, um, a lot of things going on in that ashram. And I got closer and closer to the inner circles of the group. And as I got closer to those inner circles, what I saw was a deeper level of sadistic cruelty than anybody on the outside of the group would ever see. And of course, I, it, you know, I worked very hard to translate 
what was clearly sadistic cruelty to me, to others, to translate that into crazy wisdom, the guru's ultimate compassion to elevate us beyond our limitations, blah, 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 blah. We've all heard that line. Um, it, it, my, my leaving coincided with a bunch of things in my life. I had moved out of the ashram. The guru had told me to do so. It was, it was heartbreaking at the time. I was devastated. But I left. I went into therapy. The guru had said, you need a psychologist in those tones, you know, the contempt. But I did find somebody who was not part of her circle and who was kind and listened. And he was empathetic. And eventually I was able to say to him, you know, Vermeer was cruel. And his first response was, oh, I think you mean tough love, right? And I said, oh, no, I don't mean tough love. I mean real cruelty. I was getting, I was married at this point to somebody else who had been in the group, less involved than I had been. And when I discussed it with her, she's now my ex-wife, uh, you know, she didn't, she didn't make me feel ashamed. And just as I was about to start graduate, uh, my graduate degree in social work, the New Yorker magazine published a big expose of Sidney Hogan. It was very, very well done. And I, in advance of the publication, I was hearing the stories that had led to the article. I knew the people involved. I knew everybody in that group at that at one point. And my wife and I looked at each other and we just said, that's it, we're done. It was about one more example of the sexual exploitation and abuse of a young woman in the group. Even though Murtananda had died uh, and stopped being a sexual predator because he was dead, his successors were continuing to enable that kind of sexual predation within the group. And that, that is what broke the, you know, the last straw for me. Um, I did leave. I was pursuing my master's degree in social work. And I was very much involved with a group of others who left City Yoga. We created the Leaving City Yoga website. And that was, I think, one of the first ex-member websites. Uh, Scientology already had theirs. And their, uh, their anonymous servers in Finland or wherever had been hacked. But we did Leaving City Yoga. And that was one of the first uh, of those ex-member groups. And so we shared information and we vented and we told all the stories, revealed all the lies and all the secrets. And it was awesome. Um, I got my degree and the first thing I published was the paper I wrote for grad school, which was called Traumatic Abuse in Cults. I was looking at it from a psychoanalytic perspective um, and I was involved with, in my training with very progressive psychoanalysts here in New York City. And that's the training I then went on to do after grad school, uh, another four years of in, intensive advanced training as a psychotherapist, during which time I began seeing clients who were leaving cultic groups who had found out about me because of the essay online. It was getting like 300 hits a month for a long time. And it was translated into many languages. It's still online now. So that's how I got into all of this. I was, meanwhile, pursuing having a family and uh, developing a psychoanalytic therapy practice, which was, you know, the usual stuff, uh, anxiety, depression, relationship. But that sideline was always there and has always been there. And it continues 25 years later. Uh, with me working with many, many people who leave uh, these groups. Most recently, Nexium, I've been working with a wide a lot of people who have left that group. Awesome. Awesome. Um, boy, so many questions for you. Um, so you were actually involved. Did I, did I get this right that you were involved with this group for a number of years while you were actually doing education as a psychoanalyst? No, I, I, oh. it was only after I left the group, it was 13 years in the group, and simultaneous to actually totally leaving it is when I began my graduate uh, studies program. 
and uh, with the aim of wanting to become a psychotherapist. So they literally, one ended and the other began. Got it. Okay, cool. I've, yeah. I have had similar aspirations myself. I have found it an absolutely fascinating field the more I've learned about psychology and sociology and, and just trying to figure out why people act the way they do. What causes us? I mean, at first it was an effort on my part coming out of Scientology to figure out what the hell happened to me. And then, but over this time period, it's become more of, okay, well, I kind of get what happened to me as a second gen member and somebody was raised in a cult and then you buy into all these beliefs and blah, 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 blah. But how do these groups appeal to other people? Why do people get sucked up into this? How does extremism work? How does fervor work? What is, what is religious belief anyway? You know, these kind of things, yeah. these questions just really, I just find them absolutely fascinating. Oh, I think it's crucial today in the state our country is in that we really start to try to answer these questions or explore them uh, in, in the public square. People need to start to be thinking about this because it's much more pervasive than just a few kooky cults out there that everybody can look at and say, oh, that's not me. Well, I think that's a big problem is that people think cults are something that would never happen to them. I, I happen to think differently. I think it's easy to happen to people, even the smartest, you know, the most cynical. I, I was smart. I was cynical. It happened to me. I turned down a lot of, uh, I turned down a lot of recruiting before I got into the one I was in. And I, 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 I turned down Est. I turned down other gurus. I, I told my friends, get the hell out of here. This, this is not anything I ever want to have anything to do with. And uh, sure enough, I became vulnerable at a certain point. So, yeah, I think we need to know the, the answers to those questions. And like you, Chris, I began thinking about it because I wanted to ask myself what the hell happened to me. But, you know, at a certain point, I thought to myself, and I can't really say exactly when this happened or how, but I thought to myself, wait a minute, why am I completely horrified and ashamed about myself for having fallen for this, for having gotten scammed in this way. Why isn't the guru the one who's ashamed? Why, why am I the one who's ashamed? And as I thought about that, I thought, oh, you know why? Because these guys, these leaders, these men and women who lead these abusive groups, they have no shame. And then I thought to myself, well, why don't they have any shame? What's that about? Everybody ashamed, more or less, you know, sometimes too much. I felt like I was having too much about my cult experience. Why don't they have it? That's what led me to narcissism as an explanatory framework for how to understand the psychology of the cult leader. And at a certain point, just like you, I was like, yeah, I get it. I understand why I was vulnerable. I understand my family dynamics. I understand societal dynamics. I understand all kinds of stuff. I understand my psychology because I was in therapy like, you know, forever. But but what people had not talked about was the psychology of the cult leader. Not much anyway. There's information out there. But I wanted to really amplify that idea and, and try to nail it down. And, and that's how I ended up spending 20 years thinking about the issue and finally coming out with the book traumatic narcissism, relational systems of subjugation. Because what I understood was that these people have a particular, absolutely compelling need to subjugate other people. And that's what I wanted to understand. And I, and I really want to dive all the way into that because I want to understand it as well. There has been an idea in my head um, for lack of understanding, you know, causal agents in regards to this, yeah. um, that they simply exist, that there's, a, that there's a certain percentage of the population. We don't know exactly what that percentage might be. At least I don't off the top of my head. I'm curious what you think. Because uh, you mentioned that it's probably more pervasive than people think. I agree with you on that. Um, but I've wondered, is it just something that they're, 
is it is somebody born that way? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it a combination? How does this happen to somebody? You know, we talk about it in terms of sociopathy, where somebody can't empathize. We have narcissism, where somebody is completely self-obsessed or is, you know, they cannot view the world through any other lens than their own. Now, we all can't view the world through any other lens than our own, but a narcissist doesn't seem to have any awareness that other people exist in any way except in some fashion to serve them or be their puppets or something or to somehow if they if you don't contribute in some significant fashion to my life you don't even exist you're useless and 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 why would i even you know spend any time thinking about you seems to be yeah. some of where narcissists come from so so what do you what's what's been your take on all this well look here's here's what i have been thinking about and trying to pull together in a way that makes sense to other people. And um, here's what came, here's how, here's what I've come up with in a, in a nutshell. Of course, you know, I wrote a whole book about it, so I've elaborated it pretty extensively in, the, in what I've written. But I think it's, I think it's not so uh, hard to grasp. What I, first of all, I think all of us are a product of nature and nurture. There's never not a combination. However, I would say this, that there are people who might be somewhat narcissistic and tend to be dominating and so on, and that might be part of their nature. But that doesn't necessarily become the, the pathological condition of being what I call the traumatizing narcissist. I think we all know somebody who's bossy and dominating and who thinks they're always right and who might also have other qualities and that are, you know, they might have humor, they might have empathy, and maybe it's mostly about them, but they can make room for others. And, you know, there's a spectrum of this. I, I was looking at people at the furthest end of the spectrum who simply had no empathy and no use for others, as you described just now, other than to exploit them and, they, and you know, um, extract from them what it is they needed for themselves. So dependency and need is the key word in how I've thought about this. In my view, somebody who grows up being traumatically humiliated by narcissistic parents or other kinds of caregivers or in a community where they are traumatically humiliated by highly narcissistic people. That, that person has basically two ways they can go to survive. One is to just submit altogether as a means of surviving, being basically um, subjugated from the get-go not not given the right to have their own separate identity as their own valid kind of human being. That's one way to go, submission. The other way to go is to identify with the narcissist, to identify with the aggressor, and do unto others exactly what's being done unto them. That is to look to, to seek to subjugate and control, dominate and exploit others. And in order to be able to do that, you have to, I believe that these uh, narcissistic leaders um, have to develop a delusion of their own superiority, their own perfection. The word used in psychoanalytic jargon is omnipotence. They have to develop a delusion of their own omnipotence that tells them whatever I want and need is justified whatever I think is right, and whatever anybody disagrees with me about means that they're bad, that they're wrong. And uh, either you're with me or you're against me. They develop this idea of themselves as, as being absolutely superior, perfect, and shame-free. They have, in other words, they were so humiliated growing up that their solution to the problem is to have no shame whatsoever. If I if I want to triumph over being over my humiliation, that's one way I could do it. I can say I'm actually perfect, and if anybody's supposed to be ashamed, it should be you. And if you think about what happens in cults, 
the leader tells you, the leader presents himself or herself as absolutely perfect, superior, and unimpeachable. And it's the followers who have to constantly feel ashamed of their inadequacy and therefore more willing to submit themselves, more willing to let themselves be exploited. And that is how that leader maintains control over the followers. This can happen in one-on-one -on -one relationship or groups of any size. In cults, the group gets bigger and the leader's aims become more messianic. Uh, the leader says, I'm going to stop world hunger. I'm going to clear the planet. I'm going to bring meditation to everyone, and that's going to bring about world peace. These messianic aims are what these leaders believe they're capable of doing, um, except all they're actually really doing is trying to inflate themselves and prove their own omnipotence. So we come into these groups, we hear all these messianic games. We think, yeah, I'm inspired. I want to be part of it. And what we end up finding ourselves doing is spending all of our time and energy and our blood, sweat, and tears helping the leader to self-aggrandize, helping the leader to believe in their own omnipotence. That becomes the only thing they end up doing in cult. At your own expense at the expense of your time, your money, your love, your spirit, your morals, your energy. That's, that's what happens. At some point, you're sucked dry, and if you're lucky, you get the hell out. So that's, um, to me, that's why it's important to understand the psychology of the leader, because when people leave, they need to know what happened to them and why and who was doing what to whom. I feel like that's liberating, right? Um, and that's oh, why can. I got into it. Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, in fact, I think it is uh, absolutely crucial to any kind of recovery process that a person educate themselves on what happened and what this is all about. We, you know, you're a former cult member. I'm a former cult member. I've run into many people in the field here in through ICSA or through other groups who, uh, who are former cult members who, who obviously we feel a little bit more motivated than maybe your average Joe to, you know, expose and bring to light what this is all about, why That's people right. do this. We're, you know, we're, we're driven by our own need to understand as well as trying to educate, you know, wanting to educate other people to prevent that from happening to others. You know, I find it noteworthy though, because it's interesting how some of the best people that I've spoken with about this whole subject matter are themselves former cult members. You, Yanya, uh, you know, lots of people, even... Um, Alexandra. Yeah, Alexander that's right. That's right. So, um, okay. So again, uh, boys, again, so many questions, so many places to go with this. I am interested in the thing you brought up about narcissism being on a spectrum. No. Um, it's not an absolute state. It's not like, you know, okay, well, you're inching along, you're not, you're not, you're not, suddenly you are. Okay, no, that's not, it's not quite how it works, right? Um, so do you think, I was going to, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, was uh, the dread word politics, but not anybody specific. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to bring up anybody specific right now. Because my more general question actually is, would you agree with the statement that almost anybody who gets into politics in one fashion or another has some narcissistic traits or qualities to them? I would say that you have to have a certain amount of narcissistic uh, inflation to think of yourself as a leader. Now, uh, I think some leaders have a moral compass and their self-inflation is accompanied by that moral compass or those uh, values that, that were, and they might value ethics and morality and, and uh, truth, you know. So you can be self-inflated. You need to be. I, nobody ever wrote a book or led a podcast or became a senator without some sense that they have something of value that they can express, right? And, and, and that amount of self-inflation accompanied with a moral compass to make a shorthand for all kinds of ideas about ethics, principles, and so on. 
you know, that can that can be a, a, a significant contribution, again, to the wider community. And then there are those whose self-inflation is the only real thing going on. They're, uh, you know, and that is first and foremost the only thing that matters to them. That's pathological. And um, those people get into politics all the time. They get everywhere. They get into corporations and they get into the military. They get into, you know, medical professions, healing professions, new age community. They get, they're everywhere. So I think that's the difference. Um, the the, uh, the self-inflation you need to bring about your, to, to express your leadership qualities and make some kind of a meaningful contribution is very different from the self-inflation that has nothing to do with anything but your own self-aggrandizing. You know, that's interesting. It brings to mind a scale that would actually not be a two-dimensional scale of a spectrum from left to right, but also north to south. It would be a, a sort of a, a, a cross spectrum where you have self-inflation or ego or self-image you know, image across yeah. one spectrum, but also this moral compass across another. Right, um, right. And the moral you know, compass would be, you know, would have to be linked to um, consensual reality and consensual uh, norms of truth and justice, you know? Yeah, exactly, because different cultures have different value systems and different moralities. So what we would find morally objectionable maybe in some areas of the United States would be completely fine in other places in the world or even here in the United States. So yeah. there's no absolute moral compass standard. But but yeah, I think uh, to the degree the person is um, able to uh, fit into society as a whole, uh, whatever society they're in, and how they follow and blend with the rules and, and, and uh, moral thinking of that society, I think would be a fairly... Sure. Well, I mean, that issue is what uh, led us to the Civil War. A bunch of the country believed that slavery was immoral and uh, dehumanizing and, and uh, you know, cruel. And a bunch of other people thought, this is like a very good economic system. Why would we want to give it up? We were, we were still, I think, in this country fighting that battle in different iterations. And, uh, you know, that's a whole topic for a political scientist to get into. Hey, everybody. So this is my little sponsor spot for BetterHelp.com. And this is an online counseling service. It is not a crisis line or a suicide prevention line. There are other services for that. But I wanted to endorse BetterHelp.com because it is a service I believe in, and it is something that I think a lot of the viewers of my channel could actually benefit from. It is cheap, it's affordable, um, it is licensed therapists, it is not just you know life coaches or something, it's actual trained professionals who can um, be contacted through uh, the link below, right, I'm displaying it on the screen right now, it's betterhelp.com slash cshelton, and the link is in the description section below down uh, on YouTube here. And that is a service that you can get, text help, voice, chat, or video. You don't have to necessarily be looking or talking to the person who's helping you, because sometimes that's a button for people. Uh, also, if you get, you know, within 24 hours, you'll get hooked up with a counselor. If that person's not doing it for you, you can get somebody else. If you can't, you know, the, the fees are like 35 to 65 a month or a week for the service. Pretty cheap, pretty good, affordable service. I really don't know how they do it, actually. Um, I'm, I'm amazed by it, but it's, uh, but it's something that does actually help people. My wife, Melissa, has actually used the service and gotten a lot from it. Uh, and there is financial aid for people who uh, can't, you know, maybe make even those payments. So give it a shot. Check out the link. Fill out the survey. You know, give it a go. See if it helps. I think that, um, that getting that kind of help is something all of us need sometimes. I've spent, uh, you know, I've really leaned on my friends and family over the years. But sometimes friends and family aren't really the right person to talk to. And, uh, and using a service like this might be exactly what you need. So again, check out the link below and uh, betterhelp.com.
<laughs> well, no, but it does actually bring up this idea of of the moral relativism of the of the issue, and it's something I want. Let me ask you about this now. So, because you have people, okay, let's say let's let's just take this as a sort of an a, a, an example. Um, you have people in the South at the time. We're talking about Civil War time, not now. Um, agrarian economy. This was their. This was these were human. Their quote unquote human resources. To be you know very very uh, stark about describing this. I mean we're talking about right. slavery. It was completely unacceptable behavior. But they looked at it as well. This is what's putting food on my table. This is what's feeding my kids. This is what's allowing me to have a living of any kind whatsoever. So if you're going to take that away from me, you're literally sentencing me to death was sort of their moral view of, of how they had rationalized this entire thing. Sure. Um, it, very morally objectionable, of course. There's nothing good about that. But at the same time, if you kind of put yourself in their shoes, you can kind of see, okay, well, I kind of get at least where they were sort of coming from. It wasn't, you know, just all uh, coming from this place of I, I, I get pleasure from subjugating my fellow human being. And so that's, that's why we're going to have a civil war now. I think, you know, there were other reasons. Yeah. Which leads me to this question. In a cultic situation or in one of these high control groups, you have the membership, let's say Scientologists, who okay. absolutely believe they have bought into the party line that, that David Miscavige or L. Ron Hubbard has their best interests at heart. They're, they're a couple of great guys. They're, they're world leaders. They're high class intellectuals. They're brilliant thinkers. I mean, this is what Scientologists think, right? Yes. I certainly what yes. I used to think. Yeah. How do you tell the difference, maybe first objectively as a, as a third party, and then let's talk about if you're actually involved in a group. How do you tell the difference between, you know, here's a bunch of people swearing on any number of Bibles or Dianetics books or whatever book you want to put their hand on, that this guy is the best guy ever and he's just wonderful and couldn't be better. How do you look at that and go, mm, no, there's something wrong with this picture? How do what are what are the markers or the indicators or the or the, the symptoms you can look at? Well, you know, that's the million dollar question because this is uh, because of how hard that question is to answer. We don't have laws that uh, fully protect people from groups that are cults. Um, it's very rare that people bring down a cult in the legal system. It's happening now in the case of Nixium and uh, uh, Keith Raniere, but that doesn't happen very often. It certainly hasn't happened with Scientology, nor has it happened with my group. My, my group, City Yoga, was brought down by the internet and by the New Yorker magazine. So, because of public humiliation and exposure. But, um, uh, so this is why, this is what makes this so difficult. When I work with families who come to me because some one of their loved ones is in a group that they say is a cult and they want to not destroy the relationship with that person, but they're terrified of that person's involvement in this group, which for you know to them seems very clearly a cult. Um, the person in the group will swear up and down that they are. Um, that they are completely uh, uh, ecstatic about being in the group, that there's nothing wrong with the group, that the group doesn't harm them in any way. And the family will see that the person is impoverishing themselves or starving themselves or turning into a whole other personality that they never saw before. You know, how do you reconcile these things? Um, I know... I, I don't have a means, uh, uh, you know, I, I've worked with people who families asked me to help uh, see if I could extract them from the cult. Um, honestly, I don't, I have personally had much success with that. And uh, so I don't do it. I don't do these kinds of interventions. I work with people after they've left. But what I understand from my own experience is that it's possible to be, well, like myself, somebody who is an international spokesperson for a cultic group, 
who extols the virtues of the leader with heartfelt, tearful, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, speeches about their greatness and their goodness, who recruits very uh, actively all kinds of other people to get involved. This is me I'm talking about now. And who at the same time has a private world that is nothing but depression, deprivation, resentment, and hurt. While I was being all those other things in the cult, that unbelievably exuberant, enthusiastic, true believer to a a public face uh, expressing all of that, there was a private part of me that couldn't have been more depleted and exhausted and, and empty. So that's called dissociation, psychologically. And dissociation becomes the means by which you survive. Once you believe that your survival is completely dependent on remaining in good standing within the group or with the leader, you've got to dissociate because the leader is insane, frankly, in my view. They have a delusion of their own omnipotence. They believe that the end justifies the means. So no matter what kind of exploitation or cruelty they're perpetrating, it's for your own good. You have to dissociate very heavily to hang in there with that because you're being abused, tortured, and exploited to the point of, you know, like a vampire having all the blood sucked out of you, right? So that dissociation of those who are within these groups as their only means of survival, that the more they need to survive by staying in the group, the more they have to dissociate more rigidly, more completely. And um, that's how we understand that phenomenon. Is Am I um, getting into what you were asking? Am I- yeah, in a way, yeah, definitely. And, and in fact, this opens up a whole nother door because we're, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pursuing this line, which is, okay, you're talking about people who are a narcissistic relationship or destructive cult or, you know, an extremist group of some kind. So they're heavily disassociating. So you as a friend or family member or somebody who knows them could be could be aware of some of that happening. You could see right. that even if even if they're not totally aware of it because they're ra- caught up in the rapture and euphoria of of what they're telling themselves is this wonderful, brilliant, amazing experience. I'm also saying that they're caught up in a desperate attempt to stay in good graces in the group and not get thrown out. Yep, good. Um, a good and a good point. Uh, certainly something I experience as a Sea Org member. Uh, you know, everything you're talking about here as far as uh, the separation and, and the feeling miserable and yet having to tell yourself you feel wonderful all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a very bizarre way to live your life and it's it's hard to 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 reconcile it in 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 a person's own head which is why people who are more intelligent tend to i think get get stuck in these things for longer because they're better at rationalizing the the behavior they were they're able to figure their way through it easier whereas somebody who's not so clever just goes i just feel like shit all the time i'm gonna get out of here you know yeah 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 and they don't they don't rationalize it you know that's right So, um, so what, okay. So do you think, do you agree with the, um, the first place I saw this was, uh, in Steve Hassan's work, the idea that you start emulating the personality of the cult leader and becoming to a degree, this other personality, this other, this other sort of, uh, this this other set of clothes you're wearing, so to speak, personality wise. Do you, do you think that's related to that disassociation in some way? Very much, yeah. Uh, you know, Steve's book, Combating Cult Mind Control, was, was what I read that finally brought me out of my stupor a year after I'd left the cult, thinking, oh, I'll just put all this behind me. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I thought the same thing. <laughs> I know, right? And then you end up spending the rest of your life thinking about it, <laughs> right. trying to do something about it. But um, that first year, I'm thinking, I'm putting all this behind me, I'm moving on. I knew something wasn't right when I read Steve Hassan's book, the first book he wrote. That's when I understood, wow, I can't just have this didn't happen. 
And um, yes, uh, I think as long as you're trying to be a member of the group and trying to stay in the group and trying not to get kicked out of the group, because you see all the time that the narcissistic leader has to constantly, you know, uh, develop enemies and and punish people. And, you know, they constantly have to show that they're in charge and in control by showing that they can just get rid of anybody whenever they want to. And they can do whatever they want to anybody and get away with it. That they're all, you're, so you're seeing that all the time while you're in the group. Um, so you're, you know, you're working as hard as you can to be what the group and the leader want you to be. And if that means that you have to let them violate your boundaries, then sure. And if it means that you have to violate other people's boundaries, yeah, it happens. You get the deeper and deeper you go, the more you have to allow yourself to be violated and the more willing you have to become to violate others. Now, I'd say that for me, there was a line I didn't want to cross about violating others. It's not that I didn't. It's not that when we got the command to go to the various local centers, see if there were any gay yoga teachers and fire them all. It's not that I didn't go ahead and do that. I did. Um, you know, there were other things that I did. But when it came to um, go to her rival guru, her brother's meetings and throw trunk oil on the participants. Uh, no, no, I didn't want to do that. You know, so at a certain point, when you're in that position, when you're deep in, where, okay, you've allowed your own boundaries to be violated, but now you have to violate other people's boundaries. Um, some people will, will go all the way in that direction. And, Luckily, some of us, like myself and, um, and yourself, anybody who leaves, I think, has made that decision. I'm not going to, I can't go that far. This isn't worth it. Something's wrong. Right. Yeah. You're right. Well, for sure. And it's, it, it is an interesting thing how, you know, looking at that and looking how far, how far can somebody be pushed? How fast can they be pushed? Um, everybody's different. Everybody's kind of their own individual. They have their own background, experience, education, et cetera. And yet, you know, enough of us can be pushed hard enough, fast enough that we end up, you know, this is where you get into um, extremist behavior and even radicalization. And I have said that I wasn't beyond being radicalized for Scientology. If somebody, there were certain points along the line where if somebody had suggested that maybe somebody's ass needed kicking because they were an enemy of Scientology, I might have very willingly participated sure. in that. Or maybe even taken it further, depending on the situation, the context, how much you know fervor was present in that moment, and how much can you get psyched up over these beliefs. Well, I'm telling you, you can get pretty psyched up. Yeah, I, I, see, I see it as, a, as the leader's uh, constant, obsessive, determination to break down the boundaries of any person that they can uh, as a means of uh, separating themselves, separating them from their own morality, separating them from their attachments, separating them from their values so that the leader can have complete control. And by the way, I don't, I, almost anybody that I've talked to who is as deep in as I was in you or, uh, and all the others I've spoken to will have said at one point to themselves, if somebody were trying to aim a bullet at the leader, I would want to step in front of them. Yep, that's exactly right. Exactly. Which leads me to the question... <laughs> Um, so we have this concept of a spectrum of, of narcissistic behavior, let's say. So this kind of lends itself to the idea that people can move on this spectrum. They can become more or less self-centered or whatever. They can also, this is uh, maybe proportional to the degree of their commitment and fervor to the group or the leader that moves them on this scale, let's say. Yeah. Do you think somebody like the cult leaders also move or could be moved on this scale and could be brought 
back or rehabilitated in some fashion, made more of a normal member of society and not so Hitler-esque or extremist or, you know, David Koresh-like or whatever, whatever leader, you know, Jim Jones, L. Ron Hubbard, you want to throw out there. <clears throat> Is there hope for those people? I, uh, I, I've never seen that rehabilitation actually happen. I don't know of any case of it happening. There are two communities. One was the Kripalu community in the Northeast here. And another was the um, Andrew Cohen community, also Northeast New England. Both of these communities rose up and deposed and dethroned their leaders. Uh, Swami uh, somebody, I'm forgetting his name in Kripalu, uh, Amrit Desai, I think was his name, and uh, and Andrew Cohen in his group. Both of those communities got rid of those leaders. Both of those leaders came back claiming they had been rehabilitated. I don't buy it. Um, you know, it's not that I don't have, you know, mercy uh, and want to forgive or, or want to let people rehabilitate. There's plenty of people I could, um, I could have that kind of uh, compassion about. But these folks... Uh, I just don't see how they regain trust. You know, if they were to uh, be imprisoned, would would they, like some of Manson's followers, for example, uh, or some of the great robbery people that were part of that whole uh, Black Panther group, uh, those people in prison seem to have rehabilitated themselves. They have uh, become advocates for other prisoners. They've uh, helped create libraries or helped develop educational opportunities for other prisoners. They use their intelligence and their skills for good in the prison system. But these guys, when they go to prison, that doesn't happen. Often what happens is that they go out of their minds. They become completely delusional and hallucinatory and sometimes kill themselves. Mm. And... Uh, and that's what I have seen in many of the cases of leaders who have been exposed or, or uh, you know, brought into the criminal justice system. Not that they rehabilitate, but that they go, either they really go fully insane or they commit suicide. That is so. interesting. That is very interesting. Hubbard himself had medical conditions, had strokes. Apparently, you know, at the end of days was, was a pretty, his last eight days or something were, were just buried in dysphagia. Um, but that was him. I mean, that was a kind of a unique circumstance. He wasn't in prison. He was just kind of right. by himself. Um, I don't know what would happen to David Miscavige if you were to isolate him and throw him into a jail cell or something, but I imagine it wouldn't be pretty. I think the narcissism of these, at this level of narcissism, of this you know, level of like a national leader or a cult leader, um, you know, Hitler committed suicide as well. Uh, at this level of narcissism, I think that um, the, uh, the delusion includes the idea of immortality. Yep. I, um, and, and, uh, and in fact, they are mortal and they are going to die. So, um, you know, I think facing death for these folks is the ultimate humiliation or facing uh, total exposure and, and imprisonment, ultimate humiliation, uh, unless they see a path for maintaining control, they go nuts. Manson went completely insane in prison. Um, or they kill themselves. And this is really? what I think. That actually, that, that's actually very interesting. It, it, it brings to mind so many ideas or theories here about control, their ability, their, their necessity to, to control the situation, control the, the milieu, so to speak, that, you know, ha all the people in their world. I mean, David Miscavige is an example, is someone who maintains utter control of his entire environment. And if exactly. he can't have that control, he won't go there. He won't go be interviewed by, say, a, a media source, mainstream media or something. His world is entirely controlled. 
Yes. And uh, one yeah. wonders if there isn't, this, this brings to mind the idea that maybe on this scale we're talking about, there's some point of no return. There's a place you get to, whether it's when you're eight years old or 18 or 80, I don't know. But at some point, there might be a place where you've simply crossed a line that you cannot return from as a narcissist. I, I think that's right, Chris. Interesting. Very interesting, because it actually is another heads up and warning sign for those uh, people who are cult followers or who get into these narcissistic relationships or get into this kind of a situation where you could potentially get so far along in the dissociation process, in the, in the personality switch process, that you just get to a point where you're not coming back. Right. You know, I, I also, yes, I agree with that completely. I'll say this, though, that I think that um, there's a, a, a simplistic, oversimplified way of sort of thinking about people in general is that some people lean toward the more manic and some lean toward the more depressive. And I think that those who might lean more toward the manic might be the ones who might go uh, beyond the pale, just go too far down that line to be able to come back. Whereas I think it's often the depressives uh, that who are the ones who leave. Um, uh, you know, it takes one to know one, okay? So, um, uh, 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 yeah, well, you know, that's what I was dealing with too. And, um, and I think there's something about being more on the depressive, less on the manic scale that that sort of says, uh, you know, I can't fully um, devoid myself of, of, you know, the kinds of human emotions that, it, that tend to evoke empathy or sympathy or, or kindness. You know, um, a manic person could go pretty far in justifying that any means is justified by the end. Yes, for sure. Uh, huh. Well, you know, it is. It, there are lots of models that oversimplify things in our effort to understand how some of this stuff works because there are a lot of nuanced factors involved in people's behavior and psychology. Yeah. But, but these models are useful. And I, I wanted to ask, you know, is there we spend a lot of time, former cult members or people in general, cult watchers even, they get fascinated by this stuff, looking at um, why do people act this way? What drives these guys? How do people fall for cults in the first place? What is it with these leaders? How come they're so raw? Beyond the the sort of looky-loo aspect of that, do you think there's actually a use for really digging in and understanding this stuff? Like, where, where do we, how, how practical is this? Well, here's the thing. Um, I think we have to be a little bit humble because we, we almost never get to interview, uh, psychologically get a valid interview out of a cult leader. And so I don't think it's ever happened. Right. And, um, And, you know, yeah, people in jail get interviewed and psychologically diagnosed as psychopaths or this or that. But if they're not in jail, nobody's sitting down and getting a real diagnostic picture of what makes this person tick. So the best we can come up with, this is how I've gathered my information from myself, from my own experiences, from the experiences of fellow peers who have also uh, been involved in cults, left cults, from colleagues who work with people who have left cults, and from all the people I've worked with as a psychotherapist who were either in a cult or in a narcissistic relationship, and gathering information from their descriptions, their accounts, their experiences, is what has led me to formulate ideas about how to understand these people, why they are the way they are, and how to understand those who follow them. And we do our best to generate ideas about this because we need to, as human beings, we need to, uh, we have a, a, a deep motivational drive to make meaning, to make 
to make sense out of things, for things to have meaning. And so to the extent that these ideas and theories and models and formulations help generate meaning and understanding, I think that they're useful. They, uh, they are necessarily limited by the extent to which we can take information. But, you know, over 25 years, I took a lot of information and yeah. I put it into my book. And it's the best I can come up with to formulate what makes sense to me and what has made sense to many others. Oh, it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> duh. So um, to speak. But I also, you know, a, a real valid comment on this and an important point for people to know is, I mean, I just thought about, okay, well, what if I wanted to go do a case study or, uh, uh, you know, uh, write a book about cult leaders and I was going to go out there and I was going to interview a bunch of cult leaders. Well, guess what? They don't want to be interviewed by people like us. They're not going to give us that access. David Miscavige is not going to just voluntarily open the door. The last time he did that was like 1998. Uh, you know, these guys are not big on going out and talking to the press. And in fact, right. internally, they often deride the media as some kind of a conspiracy against the group and against themselves. And oh. they make this big picture to their followers to justify why they have to be so controlling. You know, when Drew Mai in City Yoga knew that the New Yorker was going to write uh, expose, she got all of the people in India that she that she thought were, you know, half, had half a brain, to be trained in long-distance Reiki, to, and to sit in the meditation cave uh, on shifts, doing long-distance Reiki on the author of the New Yorker piece, Liz Harris, so that she wouldn't write it. Then they sent people into the New Yorker offices to try to steal files. Liz Harris, uh, uh, Tina Brown was the editor then. She hired bodyguards for Liz Harris when the article came out. They were able to get one of the advertisements to pull ads from the New Yorker. And when the, when the uh, issue hit the newsstands in November of 1994, deputies all over the world bought every single copy they could. Many of them came to the ashram in South Fallsburg, New York, where those copies of that magazine were thrown into a ceremonial um, Brahmin fire pit. And if you go into any library anywhere in the world and you find that issue of the New Yorker, chances are that article will have been ripped out of it. So that's how far, in one example, people will go you know, to discredit the media. Uh, we're seeing a great deal of that now in the public square, the media being called the enemy of the people. Nothing could be more indicative of the red alert for authoritarianism and making the media the enemy of the people. I agree completely. It is, and, and having been in the mindset where I thought it was entirely justified and completely the rational, moral move to go into the library, take the anti-Scientology books, go to the bookstore, steal them off the shelves. I mean, whatever it took, nice. this, this kind of end justifies the means kind of thinking is dangerous. And Super. it is so easy to rationalize this stuff when you think you're on the side of right. Yep. You, know, you can justify anything. And it, it's, a real, it's a real heads up when you come to your senses about that one day and go, holy shit, what the hell am I doing? You know? For sure. For sure. Now, okay, well, there's one last thing I wanted to ask you about here um, that I think is actually something that really confuses people, and it certainly has confused me. And that is, um, you know, how is it that these people, these narcissists, these, these, these leaders, these, these kind of people... How do they have such charisma? I mean, L. Ron Hubbard is derided, rightly so, in many of his photos as bad teeth, bad hair, not very good looking guy. People are, are stunned that somebody could follow somebody who looked so horrible. Well, he, he didn't look that horrible all the time. But more to the point, when you were in the room with this guy, I have interviewed enough people who worked with him for enough time over enough years to know yeah that this guy had some magnetism. He yeah. had charisma. There is no question about it. When you were in his presence, 
you felt something different from yes. Joe Schmo on the street. Yes. What's up with that? Well, let me just say this. Charisma is value neutral. So you can have all the charisma in the world and be the most evil, sadistic, cruel person on the planet. Uh, you could also have a ton of charisma and actually be a very high functioning person who contributes something very meaningful to society. Um, you can have great artistic talent and be uh, a sadistic monster to your own children. There couldn't be more examples of that. Uh, you know, Sal J.D. Salinger, Eugene O'Neill, to name two, Pablo Picasso, you know, many, many, many such examples. Um, so having charisma or having great genius of some kind or other, including the kind that influences people deeply, has nothing to do with morality, ethics, um, and character. Uh, the, the most sadistic people can have charisma and the most uh, saintly people can have charisma. So charisma is a whole uh, kind of power that, um, that is a, a human potential. Do you think it's the case then that there are plenty of narcissists out there who just don't have any charisma at all? And those are the guys who just don't get any followers or don't even pursue that sort of line? Well, those, those would be, for example, the domestic violence people. Um, right. They run their little family like it's a concentration camp. Right. Good point. Very good point. Okay, well, that all makes sense. There is a lot of food for thought here uh, in what we've been discussing. There is a lot of places to go with all of this. And um, we're approaching our out of time point now because we're about yes. an hour into this and I don't want to yes. belabor all of this. I, wanna, um, I want people to think about what we've talked about here. Um, what do you think uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, parting thoughts here, I would like you to, I'd like to hear more about your book. Like what exactly is covered in that in yeah. relation to what we've talked about? Well, it's interesting. The book is, uh, was written for the mental health professional audience. It's, uh, uh published by an academic publisher. It's printed on demand and it, it, it costs a lot. And yet it has sold 5,000 copies or more at this point. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but a psychology book like this, typically if it sells a thousand copies, that's like, that's like a superstar. So what that says to me is that far more people than psychologists have been reading the book. And I know that from the email I get, the Amazon reviews and so on. This book is being read by people who feel they were abused in narcissistic relationships whether it's cults or one-on-ones, families, and so on. So, uh, which I love. I love that. Um, I wrote the book so that mental health professionals would understand this dynamic, the relational system of the traumatizing narcissist, which is a relational system of subjugation. Um, I wanted that to be more clear. I wanted therapists to understand that they couldn't just look at the psychology of the victims that presented themselves for therapy, that they had to look at the psychology of the perpetrators. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to educate other therapists more about the importance of helping their uh, trauma survivors and their practices understand how, how beneficial it would be for their trauma survivors to understand the psychology of the perpetrators. So I wrote a book that developed a, a theory around narcissism, and then that showed relationships where that kind of dynamic occurred. It occurs in um, cults, it occurs in families, it occurs in couples, it occurs in any professional relationship, including a therapy one-on-one -on -one or therapy groups. It occurs in psychoanalytic training, which I know firsthand, uh, having been the recipient of some pretty narcissistic uh, clinical supervisors, you know, on the receiving end of that. So I, I amplified in the book these different contexts in which this dynamic occurs. And then I wanted to write about, well, what do I do? 
what do I do now that I understand all of this? Then what? Because that's everybody's question. That's the question of recovery. And that's the most important question, and maybe that's the place where we can leave off, is that recovery involves re, um, taking back your life in Yanyo Lala Jamati Tobias' phrase, the title of their book. And taking back your life means diminishing shame and fear. It means re, reclaiming self-esteem and self-love. It means understanding what was done to you. And it means, um, it means letting it recede while you go forward to make yourself a good life, a good, strong, healthy life. You know, I wouldn't be able to do this work, continuing to work with people who survived cults. If I also didn't feel that I had put enough work into making my own life strong and healthy. And I see many, many people who leave cults become crusaders and they exhaust themselves or bankrupt themselves or drive themselves crazy. And if you're gonna do this work, if you're gonna do the work of figuring out what the hell the cult was about, and how it happened to yourself, you've gotta also be doing the work on how to put the, your priorities straight. You have to prioritize making yourself a good, healthy, strong life. And then that's kind of uh, where it all, you know, where the rubber hits the road. Um, if you spend too much time in a cult and you had your life taken from you, figure out how to take it back. Big time. Great advice. Well, Dan, thank you very much for uh, for being part of this. This was very, very informative. And like I said, I really hope everybody out there gives a lot of thought to what we've been talking about here because we've um, we've touched on some things that are, we sort of skimmed the surface or, or plowed a few feet into, into some pools that are pretty deep uh, when it comes to some psychology and... Uh, you know, and, and, and the symptomology of all this and, and the pathology of all this. So um, anyway, so Dan, again, thank you very much for, for being part of this. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be with you and talk about this. And really appreciate it. Awesome, man. Okay, guys, leave your questions, comments, or feedback, good, bad, or sideways in the show notes uh, or uh, comment section here on YouTube or at sensiblyspeaking.com. If you find the content of my channel informative, educational, and entertaining, consider joining me on Patreon. In fact, I have a little message after the end of this video about why that might be especially crucial uh, in the here and now, because I need your help with something very specific to make my channel a whole lot better than it is already. Okay, guys, talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, so this is a quick short message about the state of affairs in Shelton land, in, in my world. Um, you can see I'm using a bit of a different impromptu background here at my desk because I, we have construction going on at the apartments that I'm living in right now and uh, everything is just kind of a real mess around me. And that leads me to a, um, there's a possibility, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity that I have right now to get a bigger apartment where I will actually have a room for a studio and not be in my living room. Now, this is kind of obviously important to me, maybe not so important to everybody out there, but then again, for maybe some of you long-term subscribers and people who would like to see an improvement and upgrade in my channel, maybe you could help me pull this off. What I want to do on Patreon is I would like to get up to $1,500 a month from where we're at now. We're pretty close, I think, right now to around $1,200 a month. So if I could bump it up to that, then I could actually have the income to be able to afford to be in that larger apartment that's open right now as a, as a, as a possibility and um, then have an actual studio, a dedicated space. And that will um, improve quite a few things actually about the quality of the work that I do here. So if you're at all interested in seeing this channel get upgraded in that direction, then please sign up on Patreon uh, and support my channel and my efforts here to bring you the best that I, work that I can do on a consistent basis uh, with the three videos a week that I post. Uh, I, of course, appreciate any and all support you guys throw my way, whether it's through a one-off, through PayPal, or through YouTube, 
or through a uh, subscription through Patreon. Now what I can offer you through Patreon in terms of incentive to do this is um, I, and when I first started Patreon, it was I was not doing special content. Uh, I was just saying, hey, look, if you want to back me up, that's the way to do it. But I have since started offering some things uh, to my Patreon supporters only, such as a monthly uh, dedicated Q&A or conversational video that just is between us. It's kind of similar to the live stream Q&As that I do, but it's only for my Patreons, and it's only kept there on my Patreon channel for them. Um, I also have some ideas of some special humorous bonus content that I want to put together with uh, my wife, Melissa, that I think might um, appeal to some of you guys too. But there's, uh, there's some surprises there, so I'm just going to say right now that we've got some ideas that we thought might be kind of fun uh, that we could share with you guys. And I am always, always open to any other ideas people might have as to what might incentivize people to become part of my Patreon uh, support page. So. That is my message right now. I'll um, be tagging this onto my videos uh, for the next uh, couple months as I uh, have this possibility opening up here. See if we can pull this off. Again, the goal is $1,500 on Patreon, so anything you can do to contribute to that would be helpful, whether it's just a dollar a month or more. Some people do substantially more, and they, it is so appreciated. All right, guys, thanks for uh, listening to this message, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.